This week we're headed to Bakersfield, California, home of the Black Gold, the Kern River, and the center of West Coast country music. It's the home of Merle Haggard, Buck Owens and the Buckaroos, and an inspiration to the next generation, Dwight Yoakam, Garth Brooks, and many more. They call it the Bakersfield Sound. And this is our chance to introduce to you our hometown hero, Jim Shaw. He's been a buckaroo for over 40 years and carries on the work of Buck Owens and the Bakersfield Sound. And without further ado, let's meet our hometown hero, Jim Shaw. I'm Buck Owens. You don't know me if you don't like me. That's me. Take care of the top Next stop, Bakersfield, California. How many of you can sit just it's going to be hard. And we'll walk the streets of Bakersfield. Welcome to my office, and I appreciate you guys coming to visit, and uh, look forward to a little chat. I was a, a rock and roll kid, like many teen teenagers. I'd, I'd uh, played bass in a rock and roll band, and then started playing a little bit of piano, 15, 16, 17 years old. And uh, when I think I was about 18, uh, I realized that if I was going to play uh, and to put myself through college, that uh, country music, a friend of mine said country music is where you can play in a, in a club. There's clubs all over a town where you can play six nights a week, make 20 bucks a night, which, which in 1967, 68 was a lot of money. And uh, there's not a lot of places to play rock and roll. So I thought country, I had never thought about country and didn't know much about it, but uh, got uh, uh, where I, I realized I enjoyed country music. And so uh, before I knew it, after about a couple of years of that, I had my own band in a place called the Nashville West in Fresno, California, and had a TV show. And uh, I was doing very well because uh, making good money, and yet I could still go to the Fresno State College where I was studying to be an industrial engineer. And uh, I thought I was on track. Uh, uh, everything was going smoothly. In fact, I thought I, maybe I should record a, a record album so I can sell that from the TV show off stage. I'll add that into the mix. <clears throat> so I'd heard about this new recording studio that Buck Owens had uh, built in, in Bakersfield, brand new. And I was only 100 miles north of there, so I drove down one day and uh, a friend of mine uh, had become the bass player there, Doyle Kurtzinger in the Buckaroos. So uh, he told me, uh, that I could ride down with him, and uh, he'd introduce me to the uh, the people in the office. I could get some brochures, I could get some rates, and uh, talk about doing an album. So I thought that sounded great, and I went down there. And uh, happened to be that day, Buck was recording, uh, trying out a piano player, a guy named David Frizzell, who later on had some country songs himself, but. Uh, who supposedly could play some enough rhythm piano to get by. But it was a very tricky song, and he, he couldn't get through the cut. He'd make a mistake two minutes in every time, and Buck was getting more and more frustrated. And so finally Doyle said, you know, there's a piano player from Fresno out front. And Buck came out and got me. It shocked me. The doors flew open. There's Buck Owens, who was a huge star at that time. He, he was as big as Garth Brooks is today. He was uh, as mind-boggling. There he was standing there. He said, are you a piano player? And I said, uh, yes, I am. And he said, can you play that song? And I didn't know what he was talking about because I was in the other room and I couldn't even hear what they were doing in there. But he assumed I knew what they were doing. So I just said, uh, yeah, I can. <laughs> it's like a bad movie, isn't it? B movie. So uh, I went in there and he said, you want to run through it? And I said, yeah, because yeah, I needed to hear it. Because it played by ear, of course, but there was no music. So uh, it, was, uh, it was a movie, a song called uh, Agent Queens, da 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 Rambling Man and Gambling Man, da 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 And it, tricky little chords. I think it was in the key of, of F, 
and then right in the middle it modulated up a half step to G flat, which was just horrible. Just, uh, you know, I can't even play it today. And I, you know, I couldn't write, but I somehow got through that song without making a mistake. And Buck said, uh, can you stay for the rest of the session? And so I did. And uh, at the end of the session, he said, he said, go in there and give him uh, your uh, paperwork. You've got to fill out a W-9 and, and get your address and we'll pay you the union scale for the session. And uh, he said, uh, are you available to do more of these? And I said, sure, I'll leave my phone number. So uh, that's how I started recording with the Buckaroos, March 8th of 1970 was that day. And the only reason I know that is because I stumbled on the, uh, the, the tape, the, the reel of tape of that day, and the track assignment sheet was inside, and it had the date. And I thought, ah, now I know what day it was. But then he called me in uh, at the end of May, after I'd been doing that for three months, and said, uh, uh, come on down and see me, I'd like to chat, and offered me the buckaroo job. And uh, that was a tough choice for me. I. Uh, said I was doing very well. I was making a lot of money, stupid money, for being as old as I was with that TV show and, the, and the, my own band. And, and so I got out the old legal pad, the line down the middle, pros and cons, and making that decision. And all of a sudden, the thing came up like, if I don't do this, I'll always wonder the rest of my life, what did I pass up? Because he was a big star there traveling all over the world. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized that uh, that's it. That's it in a nutshell. I have to take this job. Hundreds of times I've been asked, uh, what is the Bakersfield sound, and why did it happen, and what defines the Bakersfield sound, and uh, it's, 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 it's an interesting question because I've wondered about the same thing myself. When you, uh, when you go back into the 50s and 60s, uh, there, uh, there, there was uh, Bakersfield, but there was also Visalia, there was Fresno, I'm going up the valley here, Merced, Madeira. Uh, Stockton, Sacramento, and all along the valley, these same people came from Oklahoma and Texas and during the Dust Bowl. They came back here during the, you know, the Grapes of Wrath kind of a thing, and their old Model T's and Model A's came out here and picked fruit and crops, and, and uh, they were derived, uh, uh, that made, called Okies and Arkies, and, and uh, had, a, had a tough life. And uh, they played their music in the honky tonks, and that music uh, became very unique and very strong. And I think, okay, why don't they call it the San Joaquin Valley sound? You know, what 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 it narrowed it down to this? And my answer is is uh, two people, and that's Buck Owens and Merle Haggard, uh, rising out of all of this hotbed of talent, all these players. You had uh, first Buck Owens who opened the doors and got Ken Nelson down in Los Angeles to give him a chance and hit it very, very big. Next thing you know, he's having number one records. And that opened the door for Merle Haggard, who was truly uh, a genius, who uh, Buck, Buck himself said is the best singing singer-songwriter there ever was. I mean, he's a poet and, uh, and deserved everything he got. And so these guys were so huge that uh, other people came out and got attention because of them, and some other things happened out of Bakersfield, and a few things had happened before, you know. Uh, I, uh, Furlan Husky, I think, lived in this area, and uh, uh, there, there were some old timers that came from here, but what made it happen was Buck and Merle, just like uh, what made the outlaw sound in Austin happen was Waylon Jennings and Willie Nelson. I'm not taking anything away from Jerry Jeff Walker and a bunch of other people back there, but what made it a phenomenon and made it go worldwide and get recognized and named was those two guys. So I think that's what we had. We had Buck and Merle. 
the Bakersfield it sound itself timed out wonderfully because at that time country music had become very cosmopolitan, they call it countrypolitan. String sections, very smooth. The Nashville sound was very smooth. They were trying to go pop. They are trying to sell more records. Country records would sell, uh, number one record would sell 80, 90,000. They wanted to sell a million. So how can we do that? We got to get on the pop charts. Let's sound more pop. And so they were chasing that down to the detriment of solid country music. And so Buck came along with a small band, you know, four or five musicians playing where you could actually hear the musicians, raw, high energy, twangy, didn't sound like Nashville at all. And uh, the timing was perfect for that. Exactly like the same time, here's my next analogy, at that time, the Beatles came on the scene when pop music needed something fresh. You got four guys, raw instruments right in your face. They were unique. Uh, the music needed it. They were a breath of fresh air. And I think Buck and the Buckaroos were exactly that same thing to country music that the Beatles were to pop. I agree. So mm -hmm. that's, that's my story. I'm sticking to it. <laughs> The first job I played was the Ed Sullivan Show. And so, I mean, it, it was a big deal. And uh, uh, I figured, well, I'll do it, and it'll be two years, three years, four years, and I'll go back to college. And, uh, but it didn't develop quite that way because uh, Buck had his own recording studio. He can get into his own studio, explore the music, spend more time, and he's really enjoying that really got into the recording aspects of it. And uh, everybody in the Buckaroos at that time, there was Doyle Holly and Don Rich, and they were all, we'd be doing a session, and as soon as we get down the track and everything, and then a little overdubbing, they'd say, well, you done with this, Chief? Can we, are, are you done? Can we go? Can we go? And not a lot of interest, but I, uh, I was fascinated by the process. And I'll never forget on about, uh, uh, this was after I was a Buckaroo, probably within a few weeks. One a day I had the nerve to say after the session, Chief, would you mind if I just sit over in the corner and watch? I just think this is really neat. I'd l love to see how you do it. And I just wanted his permission to be a mouse in the back because I didn't want to get in his way. And he jumped up. He was so excited. He said, oh, 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 well, come on, sit over here. And he had this big captain's chair and he moved it over. And he said, sit down, sit down. And he went and grabbed a folding chair and sat down in it. And I thought, well, this is weird. But he's so excited that somebody was interested. And he said, well, okay, here's what happens. The signal comes in through here, and it goes through here, and here's where you, you set the input channel. And he was, he was newly into it himself, and he was excited about it. So I started hanging out after the sessions and coming in before. And he uh, pretty soon, when it came time to put the overdub, the rhythm guitars or something like that, he'd say, hey, Jim, I'm going to go next door for a second where the offices were. And he says, uh, you, you, have, you put Don's guitars on. You know how to do it. You know how I like to do it. So I do it. And so I evolved into becoming a record producer because eventually all of a sudden he said, hey, uh, Susan Ray has a session and uh, uh, go ahead and put the thing together for me. So all of a sudden uh, I started getting my name and things as a, as a producer, probably because he trusted that I would do it the way he, he would like to do it year or two go by like that and I'm doing more and more things. He used to call it giving me another hat. He says, I'm going to got another hat for you to wear. And uh, he, uh, uh, we had a guy named Bob Morris running Blue Book Music and Blue Book Music was our publishing company and it was doing very well. It was the uh, top country publisher of the year in, in uh, Record World magazine uh, and the top 100 on the charts 
one week. We had we published 13 of the songs. It was a big deal. One of our writers, of course, was Merle Haggard, and of course Buck Owens and a bunch of other people we had. So it was a going concern, and I knew nothing about publishing. I just, like most people, just barely knew it that there was such a thing as publishing. And uh, Bob Morris uh, wanted to leave, to retire, to go back to Arkansas, and Buck says, I'd like you to take over the publishing company. And I said, uh, <clears throat> I mean, this is a, a very important company, and, and he, says, he says, I trust that you're going you're gonna to learn how to do it. It's time for you to have another hat. I had literally three hours overlap with Bob and when we had a long lunch, and he took off, and, and I had to learn. This is before there's Google and YouTube, and, you know, you, it's, it's, it's tough to learn things in those days. But I started running a publishing company, and uh, I was still traveling with the Buckaroos at that time, but I was getting really busy. We'd get off the road, and everybody else got to go home and hang out with the baby's mama, and, uh, and I'd go into the office. So uh, we got to the point in the mid late 70s where uh, sometimes I wasn't even going out on the road on the one-nighters. I would just do the uh, Las Vegas things and there was a bit of a transition there. But TV shows, uh, things like that, I, I continue to do all the time. One of the things that, that Buck did was, uh, uh, w he's obviously known for Hee Haw, he and Roy Clark, and that was a huge thing. But Buck opened a lot of doors for country singers doing uh, doing national variety TV shows that, that country singers hadn't been on before. And we did everything from uh, uh, the Ed Sullivan show and the Glenn Campbell show and, and uh, uh, Tony Orlando and Dawn and, and all the talk shows. We did The Tonight Show a bunch of times and, and uh, lots, of, uh, lots of things like that. Part of our job was uh, to go back and do the Hee Haw tapings in Nashville which was twice a year. We went in the summer and we went in the fall and we taped 13 shows each time. We were on the road, the last 10, 15 years we were on the road, it, well, it got a lot better. We started chartering jets, trust me, you know. I don't, I don't really want to be a billionaire because I don't want six houses and a stable of cars and everything, but boy, the private jet. That, that's the thing that is awesome, you know, where you can actually travel and, and miss that whole mess. And one of the reasons he was a star was his professionalism and hard work. Let me tell you, when you're on the road with Buck, uh, we'd get somewhere, and he did this from the beginning, we'd, we'd get into a town and he'd set up and he'd go over and visit a, the GJ during the afternoon at the, at the radio station, and maybe over and go do the other country station. And then we'd do that show and he'd had disc jockeys invited back and treat him well, and the next morning he might get up in the morning and do a morning show working harder than we did. He built his career one radio station at a time. You go back to Nashville nowadays and the young musicians uh, uh, are very uh, outspokenly, uh, they admire what Buck did and Merle did and the Bakersfield Sound. We, the, the Country Music uh, Foundation, uh, their museum back there, uh, the Hall of Fame, had a six month Bakersfield music uh, the exhibition and extended it it ended up being a year and a half it was the most popular thing they had done uh, just uh, full crowds massive crowds started out six months and they did a year and a half buckaroos we went back and did a panel a panel thing and visited there several times during that it was uh, it was huge but it was nostalgic
Buck Owens did something different when when he went and got signed by Ken Nelson at Capitol. He uh, uh, he was driving from Bakersfield down to Los Angeles. Uh, Ken said, you know, well, we have to go to Nashville and record. And Buck says, I'm not going to do that. I got a good band, and I want to use my own band. And uh, Ken didn't like that idea, but he said, well, we'll give it a try. And uh, and and uh, it worked out big time. <laughs> it worked out big time, and it worked out so well. Buck having his own band, writing his own songs, and having a sound, he was a package. And uh, so when Merle Haggard came along about four or five years later, uh, Ken Nelson said, hey, I've got another one of these guys. This is perfect. He didn't have to think about it the second time. So Buck opened the door to Merle, and so now we had two huge big guys from Bakersfield. And uh, so uh, that was uh, something Buck did a lot. He, he opened doors for people because he did things very uniquely, did things that hadn't been done before. One of the things he did that was very important was uh, one of the last deals he signed with Capitol Records was the condition was that that he would sign, but down the road all his masters were going to revert to him. A master is the recording that you, you know, the, the record, Tiger by the Tail or Together Again, that record, those are historically owned by the record company. When you record and sign to the record label, they put up the money, they put up all the money and said, okay, you record, and you put in your voice and they come up with the songs and when it's all said and done, uh, and if you lead the label or whatever, those are their records. And if there's a reissue, they go to Capitol Records and we want to do a CD reissue of this thing and they make a deal with Capitol and Capitol pays the artist their 8% or 9% and it's their deal. And that was one of my hats. Uh, I was the guy that, uh, that did the licensing of those. So I made the, negotiated the deals if it's going to be in a movie or it's going to be on a record or whatever. So now uh, Buck explained that all to Garth Brooks and helped Garth get his masters back. So uh, Buck was an innovator and a guy that uh, did things his way and uh, didn't make a lot of friends that way in the early days. People in Nashville and the establishment uh, didn't like that so much. I sat in the Oval Office in the White House behind the desk. Nobody had a camera. You know, we were playing for the president. I did some amazing, wonderful things that I don't have any pictures. Now, now it's not, uh, not a problem, you know, but I mean, I, there's a picture over me sitting next to Ringo Starr at Abbey Road Studio on a record I produced. That, that's one of the most important pictures I have. Getting to go to uh, Abbey Road Studio in in uh, London and sit down and work with uh, Ringo Starr for a couple days and then we went to Los Angeles and did the uh, Act Naturally uh, video, worked two days down at Paramount. And then every now and then something will surface. Uh, one came up with the, the Buckaroos were standing next to Dean Martin at a TV show and I thought, oh this is cool. I worked with Dean Martin several times and uh, all of a sudden to find a, a picture with him. I'm, that's neat. I didn't know the picture existed. So it all, all came from the piano, and uh, I'm not a very good piano player, actually. Uh, I, I, had, I knew just enough piano playing to do what Buck wanted of me. He didn't want a virtuoso. He didn't want, uh, I remember when we did Bridge Over Troubled Waters, uh, on the album, we, you know, Bridge Over, diminished chord, uh, he said, I know that chord. I know how to play diminished chords. He says, but I don't want to play a diminished chord. I just want it to be just straight. I said, oh, okay. So he, did, he didn't want complexity. He wanted it so the folks could understand. He didn't want to play his music over the head. So I was the guy, I, other keyboard players of, through the years that I've met that, that along the ways that were introduced to me and I, they said, oh, I just admire that you never played too much. You always, you didn't, like some guys play everything they know on every song and, but you always play just the right amount, just a little bit. And I said, you don't understand, I am playing everything I know. <laughs>
kept talking about, we got to build a place and let people go to us instead of us going to them. And we realized we wanted to do something totally different. And, uh, and that would be to have the museum and the restaurant and the venue all in one space. You go down to the Hard Rock and you want to go to the concert, you go into the concert room. You know, you'd, you'd, it was kind of broken up. But when we opened up and started playing, he got all excited about the music again. We got the buckaroos together and we'd, as we were building this, and we'd actually rehearse a, a day a week. Set up a little room downstairs in what we call the phone room and set some instruments down, then rehearsed and worked up songs. He starts doing Merle Haggard songs and Joe Diffie songs and Alan Jackson songs. And I realized that what he was trying to do was go back to when he started in the blackboard in the honky-tonk. He wanted to go back to the old days and, and get up there and play requests and joke with the people and hang out with the, with the folks. And uh, he wanted kids in there, so we had to have a restaurant so that kids can be dancing with grandma and grandpa. And there's no place else I can think of as a grandfather where you can take your kids and watch live music and dance with them. At the beginning, yeah, he hung out there and had his chicken fried steak and uh, and talk to the folks. And just by looking at the numbers and the polls and everything, we are the number one draw in Bakersfield. I feel grateful to Buck uh, that I got to do something that, if you get out of bed and look forward to going to work, it's not really work. You know, it's, it, uh, I feel lucky about that. Buck used to say, aren't we lucky? Aren't we lucky that we get to do what we love? Will Austin take off again and have another scene? Will Muscle Shoals? Will Memphis? Will there be another Detroit Motown thing? Mm. Uh, will Liver yes. Liver Liverpool? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I, I'm 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 just asking that question. You can come up with your own answer. I got a chance to think about that on the way home, and I think any time a young man or a woman has a dream come true, it'll happen. We don't know who. We don't know when, and we don't know where. But when it does happen, we'll remember them forever. I can't hear the kindness out there. I couldn't find anywhere else. And I tried to be nobody. But just one chance to be my. Spent a thousand miles of thumbing I'm worn blisters on my heel Trying to find something better On the streets of Bakersfield You don't know me if you don't like me Take care of how I feel from that man Left him my watch in my old house key Didn't want folks thinking that I'd steal And I thanked him as I was leaving And I headed home to beg the street You don't know me if you don't like me Say you care Join us again next time to hear another inspiring story. 
featuring our next hometown hero. If you have a hero in your hometown, let us give them a hand. Never walk the streets of Eglin, please.